was solved not so much by high-tech means, but by standard police work, where they talked these guys into coming to Seattle, Washington, to show off what they could do. Once they were in Seattle, they're under US jurisdiction. What the FBI then did was, using a keylogger monitor, got their access codes to their computers in Russia, logged in to the Russian machines, took all of that data, and used it as evidence against them. What do you think was the response of the Russian Federation to that? They issued arrest warrants for the FBI agents for unauthorized access to a computer. Very serious contentious issues. The, um, we need to back up just real quick, partly to give the context for this, because it, this is critical question number one, which really is, where is PERM? Russian Federation, and I always think of Star Trek, you know, where this is a Federation, but that's not true. If you go straight north from here, up to about the middle of Canada, and take a left, and go to the other side of the world, And this, again, this unfortunately is, an, is evidence of my Eurocentric attitude. I've been referring to it as the last city of Europe. But my colleagues make a point, because once you go over the Urals, you're in Asia and Siberia. But their point is, it is the first city of Europe. So it is a matter of perspective. But it is far, far away yet. We're talking about working on these projects, collaboration with there are people who are still seeing computer crime at the very edge of their continent. Uh, this just is their English language website. It is a, a lovely institution in the city. Question set number two is, you know, what are, are, we, are we having a fetishistic interest in technology? Because isn't the law just the law? And part of what we're looking at is that there is asymmetry in this current situation on a number of levels. Um, and I apologize for citing Malcolm Gladwell, but he says, you know, effort can overcome ability. The inherent nature of these systems creates inherent opportunities. Unfortunately, the West, Western Europe and the United States are the best targets for this kind of stuff. Um, I believe you can never get enough Johannes Vermeer. But what's, I think, key here, the technology is always changing the equation. So if we have to step back and consider that. And um, is there anything, does anything seem particularly radical relating to technology in these images? Yeah, you've got, you've got heaven forbid, you have women who are reading and writing in the mid-16th century. Um, I do not know the story of why Vermeer chose these subjects, but they, are, they would be provocative ones, even in that context. So if we look back at what we were discussed yesterday, is there possible to have a scalable system of cybercrime control, computer and information security, when you have this huge distributed multi-governmental environment of the internet? Is it possible at all? And if so, how do you make it happen? Does all of this inform or hinder moral or ethical development? I mean, is it? Some of y'all may know the law school, actually from our offices, Lewis, Brand, Lewis Brandeis is buried right across from where we have our offices. Um, his, his famous statement, sunlight is the best disinfectant uh, I think is, is operative here as well. You're going to get dangerous, bad stuff happening, but it's best to lay it out in the open and let that free exchange of information occur. But it's going to be a painful process. Um, it's going to be a painful process when this whole notion of personal autonomy against massive data sets. 
we almost have regressed back to the period when we all lived in small villages and everyone knew everything about everybody and their family back 20 generations. That sort of passed with the mobile economy, but not anymore. Data mining against these sets can produce huge profiles. It's what, it's what Google right now is doing to each of us as we sit here listening. And uh, how will that change our lives, or do we need to accept that? And in what way should we accept that? Um, particularly the, colleague, the point that uh, our colleague made about you know, the principle of disclosure to some to equals disclosure to all, does that need to be addressed differently? And how would we do so? Because we're not used to the idea of controlling information, and probably for good reasons. That's also going to be one of the key problems in terms of an international realm. The one, there was one other big area of content-related regulation in the Convention on Cybercrime that they had to pull and make an optional protocol, and that was limitations on hate speech, speech oriented towards religions, ethnicities, things that are protected in the United States under the First Amendment, where we, let, we hope that the sunlight will kill off the infection. But that's not generally true in most of the world. When the ITU makes its play for control of international internet regulation, I would suspect that will be one of the carrots they're going to hold out by devolving back to the states the right to do more of this kind of stuff, as well as tax it, get money out of it, monetize these activities. Who doesn't like money? And this stuff just keeps coming and coming. Um, Finally, we get a cyber war strategy. The Air Force has been doing this for quite some time, but they have, a formal, they have a formal cyber command now to address the immense risks. That's the big stuff. That's, you know, big guys, big machines, big computing, big industries. What does it say when the American Medical Association or American Pediatrics Association says, you know, we need to start talking to our patients about online safety because it is a significant risk and no one else is talking to them about it. Those of you that have kids in school know, yes, they always have to have somebody come in and say, be safe online. That's like having one person come in and saying, wash your hands. Uh, we do not have a culture of propriety in this environment because it's simply too new. And the adopters of the technology tend to be the youngest of the society. So they didn't learn it from us because we didn't know it. I think this is particularly emblematic, uh, although the number of examples, usually in harmful circumstances, it keeps growing. Um, and this is one of the most disturbing examples, where roughly half of the China experts had uh, somehow had their machines compromised via a, a hack of a Gmail account of one such, one such expert, um, all originating out of central China. Uh, the, we may have, if we have time, we may talk about what the implications of that are uh, for a formal decapitation of US government, which would seem, how could that be possible? Well, information is power. The main point of all this, though, these, okay, so we all know, yes, it's bad. Now I, now I, now I rank up with some of yesterday's presenters with, you know, my pessimism. But our proposal is, if we step back and look at the way we traditionally have protected ourselves, how we have built a safe civil society can be a model for how we can do this in the online world. What we possibly have forgotten is how much blood and suffering over the centuries has gone into building the current safe and civil society we have. So it's not good, whatever we have with technology is not going to come overnight. The single biggest danger is to rely on the technology to protect us. The National Cyber Leap Year Report that came out of the administration in 09 um, basically said just that. We have got to look at changing this game, because if not, we are going to lose. We're the fat target, and there are too many people going after us. Um, with that, I'd like Professor Keeling to talk about, from the criminal justice sociological perspective, 
if I can find the right slide, um, what to do with this. All right, better yet, you know the old adage, power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely? <laughs> no slides on a wing. 